Today we're going to look at, at Nietzsche, and like I said, he is considered to be one of the, the founding fathers of existentialism. He's the last 19th century figure. We've looked at, at Søren Kierkegaard and Fyodor Dostoevsky in previous sessions, and Nietzsche is, is kind of interesting because he actually knew about both of these guys. Didn't apparently read Kierkegaard. He was recommended to read him by, by uh, Georg Brandes. Uh, but he did read Dostoevsky, and not, not everything, of course. He just read uh, a, a few bits, but he called him a great psychologist, which for, for Nietzsche was actually kind of a compliment. <laughs> and Nietzsche himself is charting a very different course than either of these other two thinkers. Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky are Christian existentialists, and they don't make Christianity easy by, by any means. They're not, they're not sort of apologists for Christianity. As a matter of fact, Kierkegaard... <clears throat> spends a lot of time attacking traditional arguments for God's existence. He thinks that, that Christendom has made Christianity way too easy for, for everybody. Come on in. Um, Nietzsche sees Christianity as sort of, you know, one of the most successful types, come on in, of what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with human beings. He calls himself, at, in, in one of his books, The Antichrist, um, he talks about the death, the death of God. He calls Christianity Platonism for the masses. So it's, you know, you could say he's like at a complete opposite end of the spectrum from, from Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky. But he does have some, some common themes of them. The focus on individuality, on getting away from sort of conformity to, to social norms, on thinking out where you are in, in history. Um, all those sorts of themes show up in him. So what we're going to do today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about his, what we call his intellectual biography. Um, you know, things that were going on in, in his life, things that were going on in the broader context, and then, you know, look at when he actually wrote and published these, these works of his. And then we'll look a little bit at his, uh, his style and, and and the substance of his works. And then I want to talk about some, some key ideas. And these aren't all of Nietzsche's big ideas. Um, it's tough to do that in, in an hour, uh, in any, any sort of you know, real systematic way. But we're going to touch on some of the ones that he's best known for. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about his influence on, on other people, not just existentialist figures, um, but a lot of other thinkers and, and writers as well. I mean, he is, he's somebody who's actually made it into popular culture. When you start getting quoted in, in rap songs, um, <laughs> you know, that, that's a sign that you kind of made it for, for good. Um, yeah, uh, that's one criteria. You know, there's others. If you make it onto a Hallmark card, I suppose. Do <laughs> you think one. he'd be pleased? No, no, probably not. Um, Could you circulate the hand oh, Yeah. Let me uh, send these around. So um, there's a, a timeline, and then there's this sort of longer handout, which you probably won't, you know, use that much today. But it's it's one of the things that I I, I do in my my classes. So um, Nietzsche's born in 1844, and he's he's born into this uh, family where he has a sister. He has a younger brother who doesn't make it. And then his father dies. His father's a Lutheran pastor. Dies uh, when Nietzsche's only five. And various you know, biographers have tried to speculate on, on, the, on the meaning of that. I'm, I'm not so, so concerned about that. And, and he has um, you know, sort of a typical upbringing for somebody who's of the professional classes, the middle classes. He goes to gymnasium. He's, he's educated in sort of the, the classic tradition. Um, and he even does military service at one point. He, he volunteers for military service in a, a Prussian division, which, you know, um, that was sort of the, the tough guys at the time. Um, he studies at this school called the Florida School, which is rather selective. So you could imagine Nietzsche as being sort of like, you know, in our time, some some kid who has a you know fairly in some ways like a helicopter parent you know mother after the father dies she makes sure that he gets into the good schools he's very bright 
he um, he's prone to do things. One of one of the the things that he, he does early on uh, is he holds a, a hot piece of metal in his hand just to show that it could be done to exert <laughs> his will, you know, because his classmates were doubting whether some of these stories about you know, the pain that people could endure, like in martyrdom, could actually be endured. So what that means is they're actually talking about this kind of stuff at a school. You know, it's not just the three R's, it's, it's classic education. Um, he, he eventually is appointed as a professor at the University of Basel in, in uh, Switzerland and becomes a Swiss citizen. And while he's there, he publishes his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, which later on he's going to criticize as being kind of off point and, and, and you know, a youthful effort and far too Hegelian in the sense that he's trying to, you know, put everything into a big system. Um, but it's actually a very good work. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's a, first, it's a first effort. A lot of times with, with, uh, with philosophers, historians, even poets, their first things are not necessarily their, their masterworks. Um, but it, it brings up a lot of the key themes that you're going to see emerging in Nietzsche's thought later on, like nihilism, you know, Western uh, culture as being beset by this deep sickness that, that comes about not because of, you know, random events, but comes about because of how we understand truth and how we understand morality and how these things uh, get worked out over time, where we work ourselves into a problematic situation. And then there's a, a, a hint about what might be the remedy for that um, from Nietzsche's perspective. And he, he, at that time, he sees Wagner as being part of that, that remedy. Later on, he'll totally repudiate that. Um, Wagner becomes a charlatan, you know, <laughs> the worst kind of romantic, all of that sort of stuff. Nietzsche's kind of prone to you know, swinging from one extreme mm. to the other. Um, he becomes connected with, with, with Wagner, uh, and then he, he starts to have uh, some of his, his first serious health problems that are going to affect his career and <coughs> affect, affect his, his, his broader life. Um, he begins having trouble with his eyes and with, with, with vision. So he, interestingly, starts lecturing without notes which at that time was, you know, you're really daring if you go <laughs> off, off the notes. Um, now, nowadays, we, we often see um, lecturers just, you know, doing it you know, off the top of their head, but, but that was not, um, that just wasn't the way it was done back then. And he's able to do it, and he's able to bring together all these, these great themes. At the time, too, he's not a philosopher officially. He is a philologist. Which means that he's somebody, nowadays we would call them classicists. They're the people who study ancient languages like, like Latin and Greek. Um, or, you know, it might, it might also include Sanskrit or, um, you know, ancient uh, Iranian. There's, there's other things as well. And then they focus in on the texts. And they spend a lot of time trying to get at what's going on. They try to immerse themselves in that world. So a classicist would approach, or a philologist would approach, say, Sophocles' plays somewhat differently than a literature teacher would. You know, literature teacher might be trying to connect them with themes that their students can relate to in the present. Um, they probably would not be reading them in, in Greek. They'd probably be reading them in translation, um, maybe connecting them with you know, more recent plays as well. A classicist wants to go back to the actual thing and, and have as much of that experience as possible. So Nietzsche, Nietzsche immersed himself in ancient Greek and Roman culture. And that meant a lot of philosophy because philosophy of, of different schools played major roles in, in Greek and Roman culture. Um, so he, you know, he learned a lot of the philosophy sort of on the way. Um, and then eventually he... he decides he wants to teach philosophy. So he applies for the chair of philosophy at the Basel. Um, he, uh, he starts to get sicker and sicker and eventually has to be released from teaching. Eventually he has to resign his post at the university. Um, and 
during this time, he's, he's publishing things. He's, he's working on these untimely meditations. Um, and then he publishes a book called Human, All, All Too Human. And then a little bit after that, uh, it's translated sometimes as The Dawn, sometimes it's Daybreak, Morgan Rota. Um, and then he publishes this book called The Gay Science. And so all these are sort of leading up to something that's going to become one of the master works, one of the, the central parts of his, his uh, corpus, the one that became the most popular book. And that's, that's this one, um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And this is a different book. This is, uh, he's got this guy Zarathustra, so he's taking on, you know, the ancient Persian prophet, the, the, the guy who sort of reworked ancestral Indo-Iranian religion, brought about this, this uh, revolution. Um, and, and the guy, the Zarathustra in this has nothing to do with the historical Zarathustra of Zoroastrianism. It's, it's a nice thing that he can hang a lot of his, his thoughts on. But this, you know, the, the character in this is a very vital, living character who has some well-organized thoughts, which turn out to be those of Nietzsche. <laughs> so he's a mouthpiece for Nietzsche, much the same way that Socrates is a mouthpiece for, for Plato in, in many of the dialogues. Um, perhaps a little bit less so in the early dialogues, but by the time that you get to, you know, the Republic uh, or the Symposium, most people think that's more Plato than, than Socrates himself. Well, so anyway, this is the, this is the book that really um, will catch on, and the book through which many people will get to know Nietzsche in the next century, in the one that we've just lived through. Um, there's a sort of brief dalliance with, with Lou Salome, who's kind of an important person as far as uh, European literature goes, and particularly existentialist literature, because Rilke has going to spend some time with her. She's one of these, you know, sort of fertile characters who um, is able to get, get people kind of uh, involved in, um, in, you know, new ideas. Can, can you tell me, is that, is that red? That should be recording. Is it? No. Oh, Does yes, it, it is. Does it say it? I don't There's see a red it. Oh, okay, it is blanking red. So I hate to lose the, the, the footage for those who aren't, aren't here. Um, he also was involved with this guy, Paul Ray, at the time. And Salome is always, you know, involved with these kind of scandalous um, arrangements with people. Nothing sexual has actually taken place. Um, although there were some people who were, you know, speculating about, about there being some affair. Most of the biographers now say nothing... Nothing actually happened. But Nietzsche will bring up this guy, Paul Ray, and he'll, he'll actually attack him in uh, uh, some of his later works. Um, and that's really, in large respect, that's his last kind of dalliance with anything that ordinary people, you know, involved in romantic affairs or friendships or things like that is, is going, to, going to have. He's going to become pretty solitary after that. He's connected with his sister. Um, he has a few friends and colleagues to whom he, he writes letters. Um, <clears throat> but he, he lives more or less on his own. And then he starts this extremely fertile period. Um, he publishes Beyond Good and Evil in, in 1886. Uh, 1887, he publishes probably the most systematic work that, that he, he gives us the genealogy of morals, which is actually my favorite work. You can tell that because the, the book was in such terrible shape. You know, it's got all sorts of underlinings in it, and I probably need to get a new copy. Um, and then he's, he goes into this extremely fruitful period where he's, he's writing literally like a madman, because he is going to go insane soon afterwards. And he writes The Twilight of the Idols, the Antichrist, Ecce Homo, The Case of Wagner, Nietzsche contra Wagner, five books all in one year. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it took me like uh, about five years to, to write my one book. You know? so, so I have, you know, 
uh, I was teaching at the time, but I also wasn't sick half the time, you know. So I, I you know, it's, it's really amazing just how much he produced. Um, and all of these are connected together. You know, some of them are, like Etcha Homo is sort of his reflections on who he is and his own literary corpus and what he was up to in it. So it's a good book to read for that. Um, you know, the two Wagner books, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see them as really that, that essential. Um, but, you know, The Twilight of the Idols and The Antichrist, he's, he's revisiting some of the same themes. And he suffers a, a, a mental collapse in, in Turin. Um, and this, this will begin the process of institutionalization. He starts writing these, these letters called the Dionysus letters to his colleagues. And now they say, well, this guy's nuts. You know, we, we got we gotta take care of him. Mm. And they try out different cures. You know, he actually gets to, to, uh, be the recipient of, of some, you know, fairly, uh, well-known at the time, uh, Psychologists who are, who are trying to cure him, nothing actually helps. And once his sister comes back on the scene, um, she sort of takes over from his friends who are acting as his literary executive. She takes that over. And, and that's going to have some sort of fateful effects for how Nietzsche is understood for, for a while. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that, so I, I, don't, you know, I don't actually take a stand on that. I'll just sort of lay out what people think about it. She um, got a hold of his notebooks, and she starts compiling them into this book that's going to be called The Will to Power, because he was working on something, you know, that was supposed to be The Will to Power, and she, you know, was doing a lot of selective editing. Um, the other people had, you know, things like this happen. Pascal with his pensées, you know, he just left a bunch of notes behind, and people had to kind of put it together. Um, the trouble was is that she didn't really understand philosophy that well. She actually brought Rudolf Steiner in to try to tutor her in <laughs> philosophy, and he gave up. Uh, he, he said, this, this, after a while, you know, he didn't just like meet with her one session. He met with her for a while and said, you can't possibly teach this woman. Uh, and, and yet she's you know, arranging his notes. And you know, on the other hand, she was his sister. So she'd been hearing these themes her entire life, you know, um, she was connected with some of the, the people who, who knew him and knew his work. It, it's hard to say where we should come down on that. What the upshot of this is, is that The Will to Power is going to get published uh, in 1901 and 1906. In 1906, it's a kind of expanded version. And this is supposed to be like the last word, you know, from Nietzsche. And then, um, you know, Etcha Homo is actually going to get published in 1908, uh, posthumously, and then you know you might say, well, that probably should be the last word because there's where he's actually summing up his 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 work. Um, so, just by the very way in which he was published, he's already kind of a murky, uh, ambiguous figure. And then once you start getting into his ideas, even more so. Mm -hmm. But let's so let's talk about his style, um, and then maybe we, you know if we need to, we can take a break. So that's a stop. Um, he's anti-systematic. And this is pretty typical of existentialist thinkers. None of them are, are for having a system. Oftentimes they'll capitalize system is what they're, they're, they're going against. And by that they, you know, sometimes mean the Hegelian system or, you know, the system of the state or, or you know, the system of, of, of culture at the time. Um, some of his work, like the genealogy of morals, is actually written in an essay format, or the the, uh, the birth of tragedy is also, you know, fairly. I don't want to say systematic, but um, at least you know makes an effort to be one coherent picture that it, that it's presenting—a complicated picture, but at least one one you know coherent narrative. Some of his other works, uh, that's not the case. We know actually. Um, from some of the, the textual scholars that Nietzsche would sometimes write a passage and then deliberately uh, scratch out things and write the exact opposite. <laughs> or he would insert, he would write some great thing and then he would make sure to insert a knot. <laughs> so he would contradict himself deliberately mm. in the process, which makes it tougher to, in one way it makes it tougher to read him, right? Because what do we do as readers? We, all, we usually want to try to 
figure out what is this this person saying and, and make it make make sense across <laughs> the board. Um, on the other hand, if you're not a reader who's bothered by consistency, you can make Nietzsche into anything you like, and, and people have. Or you can like say, well, we're going to emphasize this idea or this aspect, and this other stuff over here really is, isn't that important. So we're going to downplay that, and that's why you get so many different pictures of uh, of Nietzsche, um, ranging from the you know sort of. Uh, social Darwinist racist who, mm. who you know the Nazis uh, could could harness all the way over to Nietzsche as a feminist, which is a huge stretch. You know, but, <laughs> but, but there are people saying that you know to you know Nietzsche being the the person who's really about explaining punishment, mm. uh, some some criminal justice discourses. You know he's the person you have to begin with. Um, there's like a, you know there's probably a hundred different Nietzsches out there, um, and that's partly because of his style. He, he makes up terms, which, you know, philosophers do from time to time. Um, one, of, one of the people who likes him a lot, um, Martin Heidegger, who we're going to talk about in a later period, is much worse for making up terms than, <laughs> than Nietzsche. Uh, but he does, every once in a while, uh, create new, new terms. He, he reworks the meaning of, of terms. So he'll talk about, you know, for example, the transvaluation of values. And when you read that, what the hell is that? <laughs> and, and, you know, when you read through it, then, then it starts to make sense because he, he does explain what he means by that. But at first, it's, it's supposed to be jarring. And he wanted it to be that way. He is a person who is trying to, um, you know, shake us up and to, to get us to, to uh, look at things in, in very different ways. So he's deliberately provocative. Um, the story that he tells in his works, even in single works, is not a simple narrative. And, and a lot of times readers want to reduce, for example, with the, the birth of tragedy, his first work, people want to say, ah, it's all about the Apollonian and the Dionysiac, and we all have these two sort of things, order and chaos, you know, spontaneity and discipline, and so we can, we can you know, yin and yang, and we can transpose it into that. But... Um, that only works for like the first couple chapters. Because if you read on, then there's this the Socratic. And there's also things that don't fit into any of these classifications. And so he's developing kind of a complex picture that takes a lot of work to, to, to reconstruct. Um, but it's easy, you know, the way he sets it up to, to sort of like put yourself into the narrative, uh, especially. This is, I think, why Nietzsche will always perennially, perennially appeal to uh, alienated undergraduates, especially <laughs> if, you, if you want to think of yourself as being the super person, you know, the, the uber yeah. um, that, that That theme will always, you know, you're not going to define me, man, that, that sort of thing. Not, that's always going to, you know, be catchy. But there's so much more there. So before we go into some of these key ideas, any any questions or comments or things that we should sort of hash out at this point? The, uh, some of the comments that you made yeah. about stylistically, yeah. um, at least in my mind, echo back to, uh, to Emerson. I he read Emerson. Emerson, yeah. the Emerson, Emerson uh, is, uh, he says right in one of his uh, things, he says, uh, you know, um, consistency is a bugaboo of small mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, or words to that effect. Yeah. And and, uh, <clears throat> um, and he also will put things and say things in ways that, you know, kind of slap you around a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, maybe he was influenced by Emerson or maybe they're both in, influenced by a kind of world view that's going on and developing at that time in the West. Yeah. The, you know, and it's just coming out in different ways in different people's writing. There's, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about connections between Nietzsche and Emerson. Nietzsche himself says that he got his idea for doing aphorisms from Lichtenberg, yeah. who's this, uh, uh, again, anti-systematic German scholar. He's a lot of fun to read. Um, but hard to figure out what you know what exactly he's getting at. Um, he was an essayist, sort of like you know, and an aphorist. A yeah, aphorist, sort of like like Emerson was. Um, you know, one of the things Nietzsche 
is, is reacting against German philosophy. And so that means Kant in part, because you know, there, was, there was Kant and then there was Neo-Kantianism. Um, and then he's reacting against Hegel. And one of the things that, you know, when we focus on Hegel, a lot of times people want to talk about, it. Hegel puts everything into this systematic perspective and it's all progress. And, you know, they'll bring up thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That whole thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing is that sort of slaps in the face, though. When you're in the middle of it, mm -hmm. you know, it's supposed to have that jarring effect. That got lost after Hegelian philosophy becomes, you know, the, the status quo. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's some connections there. there I think you're, you're right. There's, there's a broader culture that they're, they're coming out of. Um, Nietzsche also, you know, he... he he credits a lot of. He actually says, "I don't think there, is, you know, German culture is, is culture at all. The only culture we're speaking of in, in, in European culture is French culture." And then he writes about all these French guys that he, he likes, like Stendhal, and you know. Um, but that might have been him just like swinging to an extreme. You know, it's very difficult to figure out yeah, right. what to make of that. I think there are physiological components in both Emerson and Nietzsche. You know, in other words, that... To make them anti-systematic, you mean? I worked with learning disabled <laughs> young yeah. people. And the, the way their mind, you know, operates is so different. Uh, people who don't have that kind of way of organizing uh, think in terms of steps. Yeah. But uh, a lot of times, LD people are like... Um, you touch a spider web and the whole thing vibrates, so you can make wonderful leaps. Um, so I see for Nietzsche though, when he wanted to, he could be as systematic as anybody yeah, else. Yeah. You know. Um, but this wonderful creative power. Yeah. I think uh, oftentimes has some kind of physiological. You know, Nietzsche. Basis. Nietzsche thought that that the body really is. He talks about this in, in, in uh, I don't know if I marked this passage, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, but he's got this great discussion about the body. Um, he really is a materialist, but, but one who doesn't buy into um, most people's version of it. Here we go. He says... Uh, He's talking about that the body as being our sort of instrument of knowledge. Um, ah, here we go. It's, it's in a, past, a section called Of the Despisers of the Body. And he says, The body is a great intelligence, a multiplicity with one sense, a war and a peace, a herd and a herdsman. Which actually sounds very Whitman like, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then he says, your little intelligence, which you call spirit, is also an instrument of your body. So our, our mind, spirit, you know, Geist is, is mind or spirit. Um, it's supposed to be sort of something that comes out of our body, that our body uses to, to make sense out of other things. But ultimately, our body is what is most real. And he resists the kind of reductions of, of the body that scientists were interested in doing, where it comes just inert, you know. Mm -hmm matter put together in certain ways. He wants to get something to, um, something vital. And he says, uh, um, the self and the ego, they both come out of the body as well. So, yeah. What does he mean by the spirit? Well, the German word is Geist. Yeah. Geist can mean spirit in the sense of like spiritual. Mm -hmm. It also means mind. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about, you know, like Geistige Werte, we were talking about, we would translate that as spiritual values, but that can include everything from engaging in science to, you know, mysticism and monasticism and everything in, in between. So it's a broader term. French has a similar thing with, with esprit as well, which, which even worse can mean not only mind or spirit, but it can also mean wit. Yeah. In English we have French all, wit. Yeah, we have all these different words. Yeah. Dry wet. You know. uh, well let's let's look at a, a, a few of these themes. Let's see how we're doing on time. So um, these won't be in the, the handouts, um, unfortunately. Um, 
So one of the key themes that he comes back to over and over again is what he calls the will to power. Nietzsche metaphysically, every metaphysics has some sort of view about what's most real. What, what is determining or driving other things. It could be what everything's made of, if you have you know, that kind of metaphysics. <clears throat> For Nietzsche, it's the will. And he doesn't think that you know, the will is merely the faculty of choice that other people have, have talked about it as in, in their, um, you know, what we call philosophical anthropologies. There's their study of the human person. He thinks that every living thing has a will to dominate other things, that that's in integral to life itself. <clears throat> so the plant, you know, dominates its environment to the degree that it can. And some successful plants, you know, like uh, black walnut trees. Any of you have black walnut trees? <laughs> but what's, what's, you know, what's bad about those compared to other things? All the seeds. <laughs> well, there's, there's that. It's a mess. They also produce a poison that will kill other plants. That's an adaptation that's, you know, making them kind of uh, more successful. And, you know, weeds, uh, weeds are, are uh, the plants that tend to do so much more uh, well than, than the plants that we'd like to grow in our gardens. Um, but they're expressing a will to power. Very low level. And then we get to animals. Animals do this as well. What's that? Darwin. Yeah, and now Darwin didn't frame it in terms of will to power. He framed survival. it. In, yeah. Survival of the fittest. Yeah, although there's a vacuousness then, to that yeah. because what's the fittest? The ones who survive. And you know? where's the will? I mean, it's not exactly. Darwin is coming out of a sort of British mechanistic, utilitarian type of viewpoint. That's why mm -hmm. Darwin was so easily sucked into to Spencer, and Nietzsche is rejecting a lot of that. He's mm -hmm. saying that these guys don't go far enough that they're missing what's, what's really at the center of this. Uh, and then once we get to human beings, we're the dangerous animal, the most dangerous animal, because we're kind of an aberration. The other animals, they have their instincts, they do their things, you know, sometimes things go awry and they do weird things. We know this through you know, observing animal behavior. But for the most part, they're kind of restricted. Human beings are rather unrestricted, or at least we've become <coughs> such. And we have all these ways in which <clears throat> we can express the will to power. You know, we can even put together things like states, you know, or, or systems of morality by which we, we attempt to, to impose power on, on each other. And so Nietzsche thinks that at the beginning, the will to power uh, takes place through what, you, what he calls the original morality, the morality of the nobles, which we'll, we'll come to in a moment. And then, you know, there's, there's other people. If somebody's in charge, that means somebody else is going to be underneath. And they don't really like that. You can make them like that if, if you set up a hierarchy where, you know, this guy's in charge, and then this guy's, you know, one down. But at least he gets to lord it over these people down here, you know. But then, you know, what about them? They're probably not going to like that. And they can either accept it and find some way to make sense of it, like saying, well, there are betters, you know. Or they can give rise to what he calls the slave revolt in, in morality, uh, which he thinks characterizes all of Western culture, um, with few exceptions, from Socrates on. And, and he thinks that, that Christianity and, and Judaism are just sort of religious you know, um, correlates of, of, of that sort of philosophical... Correlates of what? That philosophical attitude, of which, which slave morality. Can you go into that a little? I will in just a moment. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the, this will to power notion. So Nietzsche thinks that every single thing has a will to power, and human beings in particular. That that's what's really behind everything else. We're, we're always that's the most basic part of ourselves. It can get all twisted up, and that, that's part of what's going to happen in, in slave morality and resentment. Um, but it's always there. So yeah. that's most fundamental. He thinks that all philosophies come out of this as a way to try to make, you know, we, we, we want to dominate ideas or we want to dominate reality. Um, he thinks that religions come out of this. He thinks that economics. Control. 
Could, yeah. you, could you use the word control yeah. instead it, of power? No, because control is a more narrow notion than, than what he calls power. Because I might have, the will to power might be expressed in just eradicating something. Yeah. That's, you know, there's nothing left to control at that point. Right. Um, but it does often take place through control. And see, the, the advantage that control has is you get to keep doing what you're doing to that thing over and over again. So if, you know, This is similar to Veblen's point of view, isn't it? To who? Veblen, Thorsten Veblen. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah he's, he's taking some of his ideas from Nietzsche. Yeah. Um, In other words, he, he was saying that you dominate by giving. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know who else? Uh, Sartre, I'm thinking, has this in all this. Yeah, Sartre. Um, work, that whole thing of domination and, and uh, just even for the fun of it. Though he's, he's using Hegel to make sense out of it. He's using uh, what we call the master slave dialectic, the struggle for recognition. Um, but uh, somebody else who would fit in with this would be Adler. The, the yeah, psychologist. Yeah, I was he he explicitly says Nietzsche was right about this will to power thing. That's what we're all about. It's mm -hmm. not sexuality, you know. It's dominance. Is it not? Is it power over or power of? Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's a that's, that's an important right. question. Power power can be power over others or power over nature, but it can also be power over oneself right. too. And and Nietzsche talks about all of these. Um, what about power of rather than over anything? Oh, over and against just just like a capacity to. Yeah, that's less it, basic. Does he talk about that? I mean, oh yeah, more, sure. That's less basic. Yeah. And, I mean, this is Nietzsche's bottom level. Everything is trying to dominate everything else, including itself, and you know, some come up on top and some come up, on, you know below, and okay. there can be all sorts of configurations, but everything insofar as it, it expresses life is trying to dominate something. So dominant death, dominating death, at the very bottom. Staving off death, yeah, I suppose. Kind of, well, dominating death by it's John, tough to John do Dunn gets into a, uh, a crypt, you know, to, to pretend dead. Yeah. That's almost like a sort of homeopathy of death. You know? <laughs> uh, so well, I think, I, I think from what you said that um, that the, uh, the the division between what I understand, uh, say uh, Christ's vision yeah. of the nature of nature, and Nietzsche's is couldn't be more opposed to yeah. one another. They're absolutely, completely unreconcilable. And the phrase that comes to my mind over and over again as you're saying these things is in the, in the Bible, Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Yeah. Now, what people don't really think about when they read that is that is one of the most sardonic things that anyone has ever said because underneath that is this laughter that's saying and all that stuff that Caesar's is worthless mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so yeah give him all that good stuff that he wants mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter and it's not of any value yeah where and and so and so it sort of turns this will to power this will to dominate on its head Nietzsche and, sees that as, as what he calls resentment uh, resentment it's a French oh, word um, and it, it means doing precisely that, saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to express the will to power, is the way Nietzsche would say it, at a, yet a higher level by showing you that I'm not going to be subject to the will to power, that I'm better than that, that I'm moral and you're, you're just you know, in the realm of powers and, and principalities and, and all that. So you're right, there is, a, there is an irreconcilable contradiction between Nietzsche's way of seeing things and any, you know seriously, substantively Christian way. There have been people who try to bring them together. Uh -huh. It is never a very successful and, and marriage. And the other <laughs> thing, because I, 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 I've been reading about this lately, is you, know, you have this will to power and there's this vision, there's a certain view of life on earth as being in a struggle. Yeah. But there is another view which has become very uh, current, yeah. is that in fact it's cooperation that leads to success. And that in fact... You can look at the human body 
as a uniquely cooperating ecosystem of thousands of different yeah. species of organisms that are all living together and cooperating to have a better life. You know, these bacteria, bacteria can have a better life. It would be interesting, if, I mean, if nature were around today. We often do this in, in, you know, thinking about a philosopher. I do it a lot with Aristotle because I'm, I'm, you know, really into Aristotle. I think, well, what if I could, you know, get Aristotle out at the bar and say, hey, what about this stuff you said about this? Would, would, you, would you rethink this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be interesting to see what Nietzsche would have made of, of contemporary uh, studies of, of the body, of um, what's going on with it, which he didn't, he didn't have access to. He, did, he, he does think of the body as, as being something like an, an ecosystem, but he sees it as one that's arranged through hierarchies of dominance and, and subordination and, and the will to power exercising even through that. And he says, yeah, you can like, you know, you can have all sorts of conflicts going on in your, your body. He tends to, to, to see any sort of attempt to, to bring about cooperation as really a disguised attempt to get other people to do what you want. <laughs> um, and, and this is where, you know, myself, I'm, I'm not a Nietzschean. I, 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 you know, there's a lot of interesting things to what he says, but I, I'm more inclined to, to, to think that, that uh, on, on some higher level, cooperation really is where it's at. Um, um, there was an episode or a series in Nova uh, um, about animals. Yeah. And the most successful animals are the ones that cooperate, the most intelligent ones. Uh, that was their so there far conclusion. Yeah. So the dolphins and the It's interesting though. And... With dolphins, we find uh, one of the few animals that actually exhibit sadism. They started to find these <laughs> these uh, porpoises that were just like beaten to death, floating around, and they were the scientists were like, "What's this?" Turns mm -hmm. out, it was dolphins. And then they started saying, "Well, they mu there must be some sort of, you know, it must have been about territory, or you know, they're honing in on their fish supply." And their, their conclusion was, nope, they just like beating up porpoises, you know. And then they're like, what's, what's this about? And all they needed to do is like go to a schoolyard, you know, and watch kids. And they could, they could see this, this, you know, the higher the animal gets in the food chain, the more we start to see this kind of, kind of spillover behavior. And Nietzsche would explain that in terms of the, the will to, to dominate. Um, sort of an inchoate way. Let's let's go on to talk about. He, he distinguishes between two different sets of values, and there the handout may may actually give abuse. So this would go to what, what you were asking about. Nietzsche thinks that in the beginning, you know, in the proverbial beginning, there is one valuation, and by valuation he means a way of understanding and arranging values. And it's not in terms of good and evil; it's in terms of good and bad. And the good are the powerful. The ones who are able to express life by imposing their will upon others, quite often by attacking each other. You know, the nobles get into a lot of fracases with each other. Uh, their, kinds of, their kinds of enmity or hatred is at a higher level than, than the hatred that maybe the lower classes have for them or the people totally outside the community have for them. Um, and... What we've got here is sort of like the, the typical Greek hero of the Homeric age. You know, if, if you ever read the speeches, not so much the action, but the speeches by characters in the Odyssey or the Iliad, these guys have a lot of guts. <laughs> They're not, I mean, Diam, you know, Diamond actually spears uh, Aphrodite at one point. And he, you know, he doesn't show any sort of compunction about it. Why does he, why does he do it? Because she's fighting on the wrong side, you know. <laughs> And this is what heroes do. Um, and, and Nietzsche sees this as being the primal form of, of morality, that it starts out being good. Those who are good are good because they call themselves good. They impose that upon the world. And then the bad are the common people, the herd, the masses, who can't, who can't push back and who have to suck it up, basically. And for a while, they're willing to say, yeah, okay, you know, obviously this guy is better than me because he's got the sword and mm. he's not afraid to use it. Um, mm. 
But then a slave revolt happens in morality. And there's a, there, he tells the story in a number of different ways. You know, sometimes it involves a priest, you know, a character who starts out as a noble. Sometimes it, it involves other things. Um, Judaism, he sees as an expression of this. Pla, you know, Plato and Socrates, he sees as, as an expression of this. But the way, it, the way it goes is there's what he calls a transvaluation of values. So things get flipped on their head. And... The, what was good originally becomes evil. Now there's a new opposition brought into play. So the person who's dangerous, the person who's hostile, the person who asserts himself is evil. And then the other person who was you know, in the herd gets to be good by default, sort of in reaction. They're not evil, so they must be good. And Nietzsche thinks that along with this, going back to that question of like capacities or powers, mm-hmm. he says... The will to power just expresses itself. And, you know, it's not like you have a capacity originally to either do the right thing or do the wrong thing. You just do things. You know, you just act. But once this transvaluation of values takes place, the people who now have placed themselves on top, who, you know, are, are the, the many, who are the ones who get along, they say, well, we all have a capacity to do the right thing. We all can be nice. You're just choosing not to. That's why you're such a bastard. That's why you're such a, you know, a screw-up. That's why you're evil. That's why we have to cast you out uh, or, or, you know, restrict you through voting or, you know, um, kick you out of the marketplace. Or There's all sorts of, of possibilities. So this is the beginning of what he calls the slave revolt in morality. And he, see, he sees Christianity as sort of like, you know, a penultimate expression of that. But then, as the story goes on, um, you know, even after Christianity kind of gets, gets pushed out of the scene, and we're talking about the, the Enlightenment and the rise of modern science and, you know, say utilitarian morality, which gives a little lip service, you know, in Bentham and Mill to Christianity, but really is about, you know, using human reason to, to rearrange things so that we can do the right thing. Or, or Kantian morality or Hegel's viewpoint. Um, all of these express the same sort of dynamic in in Nietzsche's view. They all express the many and what he calls something that's new on the scene called the will to truth. Science is dominated by the will to to truth. Something that could be totally objective that we could all be on the same page with. And Nietzsche says, well... I mean, the fact that you can get everybody to agree on it, that's a sign it's, fa- it's, it's false. <laughs> yes. That's a sign it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what, what they keep driving towards. And Nietzsche is writing, you know, he, he's going to die in 1900. So, you know, after this, this long period of progress, particularly in, in Europe, you know, where the sort of the European way of life is dominating the world. Uh, every, every place is being colonized. The, the third world is sort of, you know, just falling before, uh, uh, you know, the French Empire and the British Empire and, and even some of the, the smaller ones. Um, but at the same time, he thinks that um, humanity is becoming sick, sicker and sicker. This is what, what he calls nihilism. And he depicts this in a number of different ways. Um, he's, he's got this discussion about, you know, the last men who, who don't actually feel anything uh, and for whom life it becomes easier and easier. Um, in, in the genealogy, he, he says, this is how things are. The diminution and leveling of European man, leveling, putting everybody on the same scale, constitutes our greatest danger, for the sight of him makes us weary. He thinks that when we no longer have this is, you know, the will to power is, is, is really dangerous because it leads us to do all sorts of horrible things to each other, right? But when people are doing that, they feel alive. And he thinks that, that we, we get to the point where the stuff that we've, you know, identified with, like morality with a capital M, or science, or democracy, or progress, those can't really satisfy us. Um, he says... The sight of him makes us weary. We see nothing today that makes us want to grow greater. We, su- we suspect things will continue to go down, to become more th- 
become thinner, more good-natured, more prudent, more comfortable, more mediocre, <laughs> more indifferent, more Chinese. He didn't like the Chinese because he thought it was, you know, the like oppressive <laughs> system. More Christian. And then he says, there's no doubt that man is getting, and he puts it in quotes, better all the time. <laughs> Here precisely is what has become a fatality for Europe. Together with the fear of man, we've also lost our love of him, our reverence for him, our hopes for him, even the will to him. The sight of man now makes us weary. What is nihilism today, if not that? We are weary of man. And this ties in with um, this notion that, you know, he's famous for having said, God is dead. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You know, is it just, well, there once was a God, and everything was great, and then he, you know, he fell down a well or something like that, and now it's all gone to, to, to pieces after that. It's not clearly not that, because if it's if it's a god, it's not going to fall down a well or trip over a stone or anything like that. Um, does that mean that God never existed in the first place? He he actually um, kind of leaves that 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 open. What what he thinks it means when he says God is dead is that human beings have killed God. And God was the highest thing in the order of values. Even if you know we were nobles, we could like have some God thing above us. And it doesn't have to be God you know, in the you know, transcendent Jewish, Christian, Muslim way. It could be you know, the God of the state or something like that, the God of some sort of ideal. Once you take that out of the picture, all we've got is this sort of leveled off field of human beings with the occasional one who rises above and then just has to be like dragged down because they're dangerous. And there's nothing higher to, to aspire to. Our, our lives, he thinks, begin to lose their, their meaning, their orientation. And we can try to lose ourselves in Dionysic excess, you know, go out to the bar and, you know, get really drunk and, and dance and fight and you know, go home with somebody. But that's not going to really work very long. He didn't try that, by the way, at all. <laughs> Sick guy. Uh, but he, he doesn't think that would work. Um, and we're certainly not going to do it through, you know, parliamentary democracy or joining an NGO or, you know, learning how to be compassionate or any of these sorts of things in his view. None of those are really going to, to see us through. Um, and he doesn't have a solution for, for everybody. He's not a, uh, a, you know, from the very beginning, he said, this isn't for everybody. If you want to be part of the masses, I don't, I don't have anything to say to you. He, he, this is where he brings up um, the Superman or the overman. The, we, you know, probably, it's hard to translate. It's ubermensch. Mensch doesn't have a, a uh, gender connotation. Um, but in the superior human being. Um, in Z Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he says, um, this is very early in the book, he says, I teach you the Superman. Man is something that should be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? All creatures hitherto have created something beyond themselves. Do you want to be the ebb of this great tide and return to the animals rather than overcome man? Uh, and then a little bit later he talks, he says, man is a rope. So, fastened between the animal and the Superman. Is a rope? Rope. 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 R-O-P-E. Yeah. R -O -P -E, yeah. And so, rather than thinking of us as, you know, some, having some sort of determinate human nature, like, you know, for example, Aristotle said something similar to that. But his view was, human beings are social animals. Um, we, we realize our, our nature in being with each other. And the person who wouldn't need that is either a beast or a god. You take the god out of the picture, and the question is, well, do we just all become beasts then? Or do we transcend to something better, something higher, something which is yet to, to come? And he's awfully vague about, you know, exactly what that is. Mm. Uh, and this is where I think the, the people have gotten into all sorts of trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. People assume that they're the, 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 the super, superman, you know, morality. To, here's one thing that you, one sec, there's one thing that you can say definitely about the, 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 uh, the ubermensch. Good and evil do not apply to them. They are themselves creative of new values. So that makes them extremely dangerous people to the rest of us. 
Or what are you going to say? It seems to me that Nietzsche is, is self-contradictory because if he says that the will to power exists in everything, yeah. then why wouldn't it exist in all of these masses of people? They do. That's the slave. Yeah, the, the, the slave uh, revolt in morality is, is a, an attempt to have power. But why wouldn't they then have power? In they other do. words, the, 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 in this chain, you yeah. know, the big guys and the one down, even the fathers, you know, then will dominate their children. Everyone has yeah. that will to power. So that, uh, you know, they, there'll be an outlet for that. Well, so, there, there may not be an outlet in some cases. And that's what leads to resentima, where it yeah. turns inward where yeah. somebody gets, gets sort of gnawed by it. The person who has resentment, um, they're, they're, one of the traits of them is they're, they're constantly uh, detracting. They're passive aggressive. They, they're bringing things down. They want to bring everything down to their level. They can't recognize anything as, as noble. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much like the underground man described in Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, who sort of sucks up the insults, goes back and, and sulks in his caves, and in, in his cave, in you know, his mouse hole, and then imagines revenge. Mm. Um, and the difference is that the person with Rizanta might, you know, like leave a nasty comment on, on somebody's Facebook page, you know, or, <laughs> you know something like that. Um, <laughs> Or they might get together with other people and try to start a movement to, you know, not let those those nobles run the show anymore. Yeah. We're gonna, and then they'll invent, according to Nietzsche. Uh, again, this is where I part ways with him. He, they're gonna invent all sorts of things like we're working for everybody's good, or we love <laughs> human beings, or uh, that. But they're really about trying to exert yeah. power. Yeah. So he see, he does see power. Is just yeah, everywhere. yeah. I, I think it's inevitable. I I agree with that part of it. But this whole you know washing out of humanity is just uh, you know that that seems exactly the opposite of what he's saying. Uh, you know, is the baseline. Well, the will to power in the person of Rizantamont it gets all sort of twisted up. It's not able to to express itself. Freely, the way it is in you know the previous nobles, and in the, the super person to come. Oh, I think he's fantasizing about the nobles too. <laughs> well, I mean, he he. Uh, How he, much power did the nobles have, and you know what what kind of conflicts were they? Uh, well, in ancient society, a lot. I mean, yeah. we know that there were radical differences. Um, the the. When you're, when you're looking at Homer, if somebody is called a king, that means that he has complete power of life and death yes, over all of these subjects. Look at what happened to Agamemnon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. No, no. This, there's no guarantee that, that the will to power means that you will be successful. But Agamemnon is able to do things that the ordinary soldiers wouldn't even dream of doing. Um, like, you know, bring home a a war captive that's going to tick off his wife so much that she, she kills, kills him. him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, I guess, you know, it, 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 Clytemnestra would really be um, sort of on the same level as Agamemnon, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, there, there's going to be some in, in, internal contradictoriness to Nietzsche. Every time, I, I always have a tendency, because I'm a philosopher, to try to make it all make sense together. And it's tough to do it's tougher to do with Nietzsche than it is with, with some other yeah. thinkers who lend themselves to that more. Nietzsche would actually say, well that's precisely why Nietzsche's so great. <laughs> but you know about Christ, the thing that's interesting to me is that Christ recognized in a sense yeah. this basic human. And what he was doing was trying to counteract it all through his his gospels. You know, it's easier to be uh, to put put yourself through the eye of a needle than to yeah. go to heaven if you're a rich man. So he's constantly talking about the will to power in other people. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the parable in, in Luke about the, uh, the steward who uh, is, um, mercy is shown towards him, and then he goes and finds the guy who owes him even less and starts yeah. strangling yeah, him and saying, yeah. give me my money, Yeah, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, of course, there's there's reversals too. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Yeah. Well, that's uh, a 
That's exactly that's what I thought when you, when you mentioned that funny phrase about the transvaluation of values. Yeah, right. That's yeah. what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's it's that the world is this way now. Yeah. Yeah. And it will become this way. Mm. And with uh, some luck. And and the thing the thing is the thing is uh, the, implicit in the Sermon on the Mount is a uh, what's the word. Um, it's uh, asking you to do something very hard. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Which and not the well, actions that it suggests. Very what yeah. the very hard thing that it's asking you to do is to make sense of what I'm saying. Yeah. In other yeah. words, that's the hard. I mean, you know, being nice to people that might be really hard too. Mm-hmm. But, but making yeah. sense of what yeah. is the vision that's behind what I'm saying. In other words, he. Nowhere does Christ ever say, do this and this and this because. Yeah. He just says, do this. Mm-hmm. And the, the challenge then is to understand where he's coming from. What's that vision behind these words? You know, the Beatitudes, one of the most interesting parts of that is uh, you have all these... Um, blessed are the X, for they shall, and then right. Y. Yeah, yeah. And, except in one case. Um, and it's blessed are the, the, the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Right. Well, there's an exact reciprocity there. Mm-hmm. And mercy is one of the things that Nietzsche seems to be ruling out. You should be cruel, you should be mm-hmm. hard, you should be dominating. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I have to say that the little bit of Nietzsche that I've read... Yeah. My reaction has always been, here is a deeply insane person who is projecting this mental illness out mm. into his writing. He's a very smart guy. And so, what I, I mean, I may, you know, it could be that I'm totally missing the point mm. and he's really smart and he's productive. He's but whenever smart. I read him and try to, yeah. or try to read him, I always come away saying, I always feel like I need to take a bath afterwards. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. <laughs> I think that there's there's some there's some ideas that we have that are that um, here's here's an example of somebody who, who used Nietzsche. There's this guy Max Scheler, who is one of the fathers of phenomenology, along with him uh, um, uh, Edmund Husserl. And Scheler wrote this book called Resentiment, and and in it he says Nietzsche got these things right about the way Resentiment works. And then here's all the stuff that he left out. We, mm-hmm. And Shaler's trying to put it in a Christian context, um, saying, you know, Nietzsche was, Nietzsche was sort of like a guy who's unable to look up. Mm-hmm. And thinks there's nothing up there. That's all mm-hmm. got to be BS. Mm-hmm. People made mm-hmm. that stuff up. Mm-hmm. And the stuff that's up there, re, you know, sort of restructures the stuff that's down here. So he is willing to say... Nietzsche got, you know, like the, the way in which people who, who have resentment right in his, his analyses. Where exactly this came from or how we get out of it, that's, Nietzsche got that, got that wrong. Um, so, I mean, it could be, it could be that, that Nietzsche was, that this actually is an expression of, of a you know, deeply screwed up psyche. But like William James points out, you know, pathology um, doesn't rule out actually hitting the mark sometimes, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. He's talking about religious experience in that case. Right? Mm-hmm. Just because somebody, you know, may in fact be delusional doesn't mean that every time they hear the voice of God, it's a delusion. <laughs> um, so he doesn't. He doesn't. Um, I mean, I haven't read him. Does yeah. he mm-hmm. ever allow for um, love or selflessness uh, or mm-hmm. you know? Uh, Acts that don't have an ulterior motive. So selflessness, insofar as we're trying... I know he sees that martyrdom as a form of power, but... Well, insofar as we're trying to create something greater than us, like the Superman, then then that selflessness would be good. But then again, what exactly is the, the Superman, you know? Um, love, Nietzsche sees most love as just being an attempt to... Like Sark, an attempt to dominate the other. Um, he talks a lot about love for life and you know love um, for for the world and, and for being, 
But it's always going to be channeled through, you know, a kind of aggressive consuming attitude towards things. It's more like lust than love, really. But there's that last story yeah. that's so well known of him, you know. Oh, the horse. Was, yeah, when just before he really had a mental breakdown, where he saw a horse being beaten yeah. from across the, the city it. square, yeah. and he ran up and he put his arms around the horse in order to stop the beating of the horse and then he collapsed into the street and then was sent to the sanatorium so yeah. there's compa- I mean there's something without a word to it that that I remember when I, if that's true story of course he might have just been being inconsistent he loved horses <laughs> yeah I mean but he cared I mean I, I mean not you know he, uh, there was a being being hurt yeah that, he liked the horse so better there's something than he liked operating the, and, yeah he liked the horse better than he liked the guys doing the beating <laughs> He's also the recipient of compassion in that his sister, I yeah. mean, I don't know too much about him, but his sister comes comes back to him and gives herself kind of to his life, um, as far as what you say. And, and he has, it seems like he has no children in his life, yeah. I don't know. Is you know, doesn't believe in nurturing. I mean, his mother sounds like she was terrific, but how well, did he turn out yeah. so... Well, maybe he thought of her as dominant, but probably. You know, how does it fit his, into? His, yeah, I mean, his early family life family. I know less about, um, <laughs> and, I, and I usually don't try to say somebody's the way they are because of their their, their family yeah. thing, because because we make choices along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think that that what really drives his stuff is thinking that there's something wrong with European culture that the, the progress, he's not the only person feeling this, that the, the, the progress and everything is getting better and better, there's something rotten underneath of that. Mm-hmm. And then he goes back to, you know, classic sources to try to find a way out. And, and he, you know, and he, and he looks at the philosophy of his time, a lot of the remarks that he makes about, about philosophers often seem dead on, you know. They, they talk this great line about how they prove all this stuff and, and maybe it's just coming out of their own wish to, like, you know, run the show, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. In, when you read English literature about this at the same time, yeah. the, the feeling is that we, we need a good war. Yeah. You and, know, and the, 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 everything's, everyone's going soft. Yeah. So we need a good war. And he and he contributed to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me talk now about 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 the influence that he had, and then because that's a good sort of jumping off point. So early on, he he doesn't have a lot of influence, and he and he's you know this this isolated figure, sometimes giving his books away, you know, mm-hmm. like to his landlady. Um, but then this guy um, Brandes starts lecturing on him, and people start paying attention to what he's doing. Um, he, there were a few reviews of his works, you know, not particularly receptive. But around, you know, the turn of the century, we've got some some major figures really starting to recognize uh, him as, as important. Um, Rainier Maria Rilke, Red Nietzsche, was, was very impressed by, by him. Uh, Rilke, by the way, is, is, a, is a, a Christian of sorts and um, is doing things very different. Uh, he probably knows about Nietzsche because of his connection with Louis Salome. Um, Rudolf Steiner, like I mentioned, the father of anthroposophy, tries to tutor Elizabeth Nietzsche unsuccessfully, uh, but, but was very impressed by Nietzsche's thought. Lev Shestov, this, this Russian author, saw the connections between Dostoevsky and Nietzsche already, and also between Nietzsche and Tolstoy, uh, and is writing about them at around the turn of the century. Um, and then a little bit later, we're going to see people like Martin Heidegger um, saying that Nietzsche is the last of the great metaphysicians and, and seeing him as, as central. But then he influenced all these other people who weren't necessarily uh, connected with, with philosophy. George Bernard Shaw, his notion of the Superman is coming from, from Nietzsche. Mencken actually is one of the translators of Nietzsche into English. Uh, and Mencken really likes Nietzsche. You know, I think in part because Mencken liked anything where he could like stick it to <laughs> everybody. And Nietzsche's good for that. Jack London says that he was he was uh, uh, particularly influenced by him. Eugene O'Neill, it's very clear there. And then in German literature, like Thomas Mann is mm-hmm. is drawing on you know Nietzsche, particularly the the birth of tragedy stuff. 
Um, like I said, that, that Thus Spoke Zarathustra, that was the most popular work for a long time. And Nietzsche's um, popularity, his relevance to philosophy, it undergoes an eclipse because of the, the harnessing of his ideas by, by fascists and then explicitly by national socialists, um, which was easier to do because his sister, had, his sister was an anti-Semite. Nietzsche was not an anti-Semite, and he actually hated anti-Semites. Uh, but she managed to you know, uh, put a lot of that into world power. Um, and, and she actually suppressed some of the, the passages in his works earlier on where he was, he was like saying those anti-Semites are a bunch of dummies, you know. Um, so, you know, if, if you've been harnessed by the Nazis, it's, it's pretty tough to make a case that we should read you. you know? <laughs> uh, one, one sec. Uh, after okay. the Second World War, there was a book that came out by Viktor Frankl yeah. on the will to meaning. Yeah. And uh, he used... That, that theory, that thought, uh, to say that people uh, need a meaning in their lives in order to survive their life. Yeah, man's search for meaning. Man's yeah. search for meaning, yeah. correct. Yeah. Um, what, what gets Nietzsche to catch on is more people like Kaufman, who translate Nietzsche and then like make a case that, now nah, you got the Nazis over here and they're doing stuff, but then the real Nietzsche is over here. Um, Arthur Danto also writes a, a book about Nietzsche as a philosopher. And that's what allows him to catch on, again, over here in, in the English-speaking world. A lot of the French figures, like, you know, um, not just Sartre, but Camus and, mm -hmm. you know, de Beauvoir, um, and then all these French post-structuralists, they, they can't get enough of Nietzsche. Right. Um, and Do you think it's, it's because what I'm getting... Do you getting is that he is extolling the virtue of um, individualism versus mass, there's, mass conformity. There's that. And that people are picking up on that, the intellectuals and artists. Yeah, and in, in, the, in the French setting, it's not just it's not just like individualism per se against mass society. Or I of all the other you know, writers and people you mentioned. That, that's one of the key themes, the notion that there's like a whole hidden history that's been left out is another key well, thing. Well, I mean, in a sense that when someone tries to rise yeah. above or beyond the herd, there is going to be an effort to pull them down. I yeah. Mean, that is definitely true. It's true everywhere. Yeah. In the English-speaking stuff, that tended to be more along those lines where you would see, you know, somebody tries to rise and then there's like a new attempt to, to bring them down. In the French stuff, it's more like, well, the system is already there, and it's it's set up to repress us, to to keep us down, and it just works through these people who aren't even really conscious of what they're doing. And Nietzsche allows us to to open all that up and, and you know sort of see the guts of, see. of of you know of the power structures. Foucault, mm -hmm. for example, Michel Foucault was was uh, really taken with this this notion that, that Nietzsche had. Um, so I think yeah, there there are some differences. He's he's clearly somebody you can you can read him as an existentialist, which is what I you know I'm doing in this series. But he's had massive influence outside of um, outside of that range. Uh, well, I think I think it, you know I really don't know very much about Nietzsche, just you know from what I'm hearing here today. But he, he doesn't seem to give sufficient credit to sort of the other side. In other words, it's not that there's the will to power. Yeah. There's another side to it. In other words, everything is intention. And so like, there's sort of always this Aristotelian balance yeah. that's, that's going on. So that, so for example, you have, I'm an individual, right? But I'm also a member of a community, Yeah. right? So I'm a social animal, but I'm an individual. And so there's a tension. There's a contradiction within sort of the human condition that it's continuously there and it's always pulling on us. And so you have to talk about that and not about, you know, and it's, and, and, and it's, it's obvious and apparent like in our own society, which looks at itself as a meritocracy. But what is a meritocracy all about but the elevation of individuals which we feel very uncomfortable doing? 
so that we always we say, oh, Harvard's an elitist school. What yeah. the hell does that mean? It means that the very best people that we can find go there. And yet we say elitist in a way that's negative, that, well, we shouldn't, you wouldn't want to go there because it's an elitist school. Yeah. So there, there is this, there's this tension between the recognition that there are people who are different yeah. from most everybody else, right? Yeah. In various ways, whether they can hit a hundred mile an hour fastball or they can, you know, write some a uh, uh, piece of uh, you know analytical yeah. uh, uh, philosophy that changes things for everybody for a long time. Uh, those people are different from most of us. Yeah. So how do we? What is our relation to them? What do we do with them? What, and what do we do with them? What you know? And and what do they do with us? Yeah, because there is a tendency for people like that to sort of spill over into all sorts of other areas. They're hard to. Yeah. They're hard to. Um, they're, they're not only hard for other people to regulate, they have a hard time... Regulating themselves. Yeah. But yeah. what I appreciate about Nietzsche, and when I read him long ago in my 20s, it, it, I, he felt he was like an alive man. He was alive. He broke out of deadness, dead letters, dead words, dead concepts. He was crazy, but... I mean, I didn't get everything he was saying, but it... As a young 22, one-year-old, I was like, just like you said earlier. It was very exciting, yes. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't even use exciting. Just alive. Yeah. And I appreciate it. And, and I think he suffered for that. You know, he suffered for just, just that juice that he had. And I think he's, he, you know, there's almost something adolescent about him. But um, I, I, I still appreciate that. And I consider myself a Christ, you know, Christian. But I really appreciate and. This whole talk kind of made me think of um, um, Nikos Kazantzakos' writings and Zorba the Greek yeah. and characters like that. And, and, and Nikos Kazantzakos wrote a book called The Saviors of God. It's almost like that I haven't read. Nietzsche was, was almost like the man, the ubermensch is the savior of God because he's alive and because he's creative and original yeah. and breaking out of, uh, you know, Conditions and, and yeah. context. Ayn Rand is another one that she installs does. the. She's an interesting one because she does do exactly that, and she also seriously criticizes Nietzsche and tries mm. to distance herself from him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like she thinks that. Um, well, she she thought that he was all about just dominating other people, so she wants to have a way of, mm. like, being creative, a value producer which doesn't involve dominating other people, you know. Um, it's tough to see, you know. She has this notion that the, the like for Nietzsche, the, the best person is the, the noble, the, the predatory beast of prey. Mm. For Rand, it's the what she calls the traitor, the person who, how does she put it, um, neither, neither, uh, neither gives or... or demands from another what they're, they're not uh, entitled to, to give. Uh, and it sounds really great. You mean like self-sufficient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and like, you know, when she talks about love, for example, she, she says, you can love your wife if you want to. Um, what you love in her is the fact that she makes you happy. Um, it's, it's, you know, perfectly selfish. Um, and, and you know makes makes great sense. Don't try to like candy coat it and say that you you love her for herself. You really love what it is in her that contributes to your happiness. And you should even be willing to sacrifice yourself, like jump in the river for her, uh, but only because she actually contributes to your happiness. And then the, the, my question is, well, what if what if you know she quits contributing to your happiness then? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, did, uh, did Nietzsche equate uh, wealth with power and goodness? Ah, uh -huh. at the beginning, yes. He says that in the original valuation, the the rich are rich precisely because they have you know seized wealth and they 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 run the show, but pretty early on, you know you always have the nouveau riche, right? And those those are the people that are always like, you know, um, 
some of them are actually like these uber menschy types that are that are you know trying to rise above but a lot of them are just crass and they're bringing culture down and they're given to try to like you know try to control the old the old rich and, and they often do so by like appealing to the people um, so he sees you know for example the the, the rise of the bourgeois Nietzsche hates the bourgeois yeah. um, because they and this would also include um, not just you know like the, the Industrial mercantilist bourgeois. It would include what they in um, in France called the no uh, noblesse de la robe, the the uh, the people who made their way into the bureaucracy, you know, and and, and, and became become powerful because of that. Um, he he sees them as just you know more expressions, unless they actually become predatory. They they're just expressions of that. Well, may, maybe that could be interpreted as. There are too many of them, and they're not rich enough. But someone yeah. who rises to the top among such a group uh, would be um, good and powerful by virtue of the achievement of wealth. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it today, like what would Nietzsche say about somebody who's you know super wealthy and, and therefore powerful in our society? Um, you know, a lot of them... Like the Koch brothers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of them contribute to not just political campaigns, but to charities. And he, he would... This is, this is my take. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about this. I think Nietzsche would say, eh, contribute to charity if you want to, so long as you don't actually... You're not actually doing it because you actually want the common people to live any better lives. You just need, <laughs> you need to you know, cover your tracks so you can keep the, the many off your case. Uh, <laughs> then, then, you know... Meanwhile, you're doing what you know what you're really into over here, uh, which is uh, who knows. <laughs> um, because you know, again, this is a very individualist ethics. So he doesn't want to be prescriptive about the the life of the Ubermensch would look like A, B, and C. You know, mm-hmm. clearly it would involve good health. You can't be an Ubermensch without being physically strong, healthy, which would rule out Nietzsche. Right? Yes, that's mm. right. You also have to be smart, you and you have to, you know, try to do something at least of like absorbing the best of, of culture, but not in a, I'm gonna, you know, learn the the Cliff Notes version so I can try it out at parties kind of way, rather than like a, you know, this is what's really key in it, and I don't care what the what the rest of you say about it. This is what I what I really value. And then beyond that, it's, it's tough to say. They don't have to be blonde. No. <laughs> Maybe that helps. I don't know. Blue eyes, though. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm right now I'm, I'm watching a series of lectures from Yale University on medieval history. Ah. And your description of the Ubermensch uh, fits precisely the description of uh, seventh and eighth century Frankish kings. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and and in fact, uh, Gregory of Tours sort of has a kind of Nietzschean view of these guys because he knows they're thugs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're they're essentially gang leaders, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but they're uh, they do their job, and they keep the other thugs away. And they allow uh, Gregory's uh, monastery to uh, <laughs> prosper, and 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 so he's fine with the fact that they spend most of their time killing each other. Yeah, I mean, you know, traditionally the the way that um, Christian thinkers would, would deal with this is they would they would see it as well, you let the uh, unjust. You know, do do precisely. That. There's the Augustinian thing of you know the state is there to like keep us keep the even worse people from messing with us. Right. <laughs> but all of them are going to hell. You know, it's just a question of you know which one's going first because they're killed first. Uh, and and they they do allow the rest of us to actually you know because they stay over there and do do that right. nasty business. They let the rest of us get on with the. Yeah, the yeah, 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 right. And, and, and Gregory is saying that you know this guy <laughs> is really good because he's really a good thug. He really yeah. knows how he to be a thug. Job. You he's know, doing his job. yeah. yeah. And, and 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 um, this kind of as you, as we're 
good in a qualified it's, it's sense. It's kind of a precursor to Nietzsche's thought there. You know, you know I, we were just watching, my wife and I, we just started watching this uh, True Detective series. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, it's got Matthew McConaughey and uh, Woody Harrelson. And Matthew McConaughey is this really sour, um, God is dead sort of, sort of figure in it. And there's a great scene that, that I was just reminded of where um, somebody calls him a good man and he says, no, I'm a bad man. Uh, and and he, you know, he's being completely honest. And he says, that's why I can keep the other bad men away. Yeah, it's the oh, same right. idea. Uh, because I, I know you the way... Think like a bad man. Exactly. Because yeah. if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're too good... The bad will always get over on you because you can't predict how they behave. But if you yourself have these dark, you know, terrible urges within you, uh, and he's got like a whole backstory on how you well, came that way. you know, we could say that we all have them, but some people are more aware of them than others. <clears throat> yeah, although I think they're probably stronger in some people than, than in others too. Well, yeah. they may. Be. Yeah. Well, I think. Like if we encourage them in ourselves. I think we all have them, which is why we watch that stuff. Because <laughs> <laughs> we vicariously work out our... Well, just, you know, otherwise it wouldn't be interesting. You know, I mean, it just, yeah. it's just my, my feeling. I'm not going to go into why. But, but um, I think that probably the more we act on it, the more it develops. Mm. You know, the more yeah. we give into those impulses... To act in in um, antisocial ways, yeah. you know, the more the stronger they get. They say that the uh, the Colosseum in Rome, they started out not nearly as as uh, terrible, you know, in their killings and their torture, and uh, you know, it was the in, in, the crowd inciting <coughs> them to more and more violence. So that uh, you know, whole <coughs> whole societies can be taken over by that. Yeah, mm. but it's interesting again. The from the from one historical perspective, at least, the situation in Gaul under the Roman Empire, when the emperor really was the emperor. Yeah, the situation was much better. Yeah, there was much less violence. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the the the, the, the level violence of, was restricted. Mm-hmm. Well, the only violence, the only guy who really had the authority to really perpetrate violence was the emperor. So, yeah. you know, somebody like Clovis, he would have had a boss, you know, that he had to answer to. Yeah. But that was gone by, you know, by, and, and so you, you, you have this almost falling back to this kind of uh, uh, tribal. Uh, and the other thing was, it was interesting. It, 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 that that these people, these these thugs, as the professor refers to them, uh, uh, didn't have absolute power. Yeah, they depended on their guys. Okay, yeah. so uh, they just couldn't do anything they wanted to. Yeah, they had to take into account what this guy, you know, this guy over here, you know, he's got. 150 soldiers that will do what he says, you know. Yeah. So I've got to pay attention to him, you know. And so that there was, a, I don't know if this, well, I, it somehow seems to have something to do with Nietzsche because, because uh, he, these were these he, these people were living out this kind of Nietzschean life, but I, they were hardly uh, Ubermensch. They they were barbarians. They had very little cultural, uh, you know, barely well, literate. Yeah. You know. Uh, that's one of the things. It's hard to figure out what the Ubermensch exactly is. Yeah. I mean, we could say the same thing of, of the Homeric armies as well. Agamemnon is the, the the chief of the armies, but you know, when when he ticks off Achilles, Achilles can say, "Not only am I not going to fight for you, and I'm your best fighter, none of my guys are going to fight." Right. For exactly. You. you know. Yeah. Um, and so he has to. You know, they they, they have speeches back and forth, and you know, there's there's. There's Odysseus on the scene to give good advice <laughs> and mentor to, you know. Um, but it's that same sort of sort of thing. Um, and yet, with respect to their their guys, Achilles is, you know, Achilles is a kind of interesting figure because he he never commands in the sense of like saying you do this or I'm going to gouge your eyes out or things like that. He's he's just 
people just like him so much. The guy right, they, they follow him. Yeah. yeah, and and you know you never see Odysseus really having to do much of that either. Guys like Agamemnon, on the other hand, or you know they they have to you know have to crack the whip to, to command obedience. Um, but, you know Nietzsche talks about when he's talking about this this noble class. He says we can see this. Not only in ancient Greece, we can see this in um, uh, feudal Japan. We can see this in the, you know, Iranian stories about, you know, like Rustam. Uh, these, you know, he, he's willing to see that. He's willing to read that into these situations where order breaks down and you have a, a warrior class arise. Um, I think he thinks that in... in, in Medieval Europe, it gets messed up because you do have Christianity on the scene, sort of like, you know, as this kind of network. Well, it makes shots. it work because Gregory of Tours doesn't have a sword, yeah, but he has tremendous power over Clovis. Yeah. And in fact, there's a, there's a thing where he, he just lays into him, you know, and says, what you're doing is this and this and this, and Clovis can't touch him. Yeah. I mean, because of his beliefs, you know. Even the kings, sort of truth. Like, like in England, you know, the, the, the British kings after William really assert their, their dominance over the state. But they can only go so far. Like, like Anselm, somebody I do a lot of research on, he, he's the successor to Lanfranc, who was the, the Archbishop of Canterbury for William the Conqueror. Right. And, and the next sort of, you know, thing is, is uh, William Rufus, and Anselm. And Anselm says, yeah, the stuff that, that, that you know, William did with Lanfranc, that's not going to fly anymore. You know, <laughs> Lanfranc, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad about him, but he kind of gave in on too many things. And so Anselm has to go into exile a couple times. And the king put him, in, put him in place against his will. He actually gave him a bloody nose, you know, making him bishop. Um, because he thought Anselm was just going to be a pliable tool. Right. And then Anselm stands up against him. And Anselm almost got himself, you know, becketized, you could say. Because <laughs> soon afterwards, uh, you know, one of the kings, I forget which one, uh, is going to say, you know, that somebody's got to do something about that, that, <laughs> that, that priest, that monk. And they go and they kill Becket. And until Henry VIII then sort of like, you know, says, enough of this, you know, stuff. The, the church possesses this kind of spiritual exactly. power through martyrdom uh, over the 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 uh, political authorities. Right. You know. Right. Then after Henry, it's you know, what's that? Then after Henry, it's you know, uh, totally different story. Yeah. Right. 